I'd, I'd like to welcome everyone here today um, to our uh, symposium, Michigan, Michigan's Economy 2009 Beyond. My name, is, my name is Brian Jacob. I'm the Walter Annenberg Professor of Economics and Education Policy and the Director of Close Up, the Center for Local, State, and Urban Policy. Um, I would like to welcome you here. Uh, my job is actually very simple today. I'm going to be introducing our panelists and moderator and then stepping aside and let them, uh, letting them do the talking and doing the work. Um, so uh, today, just starting uh, in alphabetic order here, we have John Austin, uh, who is the Director of the New Economy Initiative and Vice President of the Michigan uh, Board of Education. Uh, he's been involved in uh, economic development and policy-related research in Michigan for many, many years. Um, he was the policy director of uh, the, the Cherry Commission, a uh, governor-appointed commission that uh, focused on higher education in Michigan. He's co-authored uh, a number of uh, reports and papers, including Revitalizing Michigan Cities. And he is, uh, as I mentioned, currently leading kind of a, a very large, well-known initiative on the new economy to try to uh, bring Michigan uh, uh, through its transition from manufacturing to a uh, more diversified economy. And we're glad to have him here. Charlie Ballard is a professor of economics at Michigan State University uh, and the director of the MSU State of the State Survey. Um, he has also been working in uh, uh, Michigan economic development policy for many years. Um, in addition to being a, an excellent public finance economist, uh, more broadly, he has remarkably detailed and in-depth knowledge of the Michigan economy. He's uh, authored a number of books, including Michigan at the Millennium, Michigan's Economic Future, and Real Economics for Real People. Um, we're glad to have him here with us. And then we have uh, Chris Heider, who's the program director of economic development program at the National Governors Association. He directs policy and legislative analysis uh, for the National Governors, Governors Association. And we're hoping uh, that his presence here today will help us uh, kind of bring a national perspective uh, to the economic de cha development challenges in Michigan, shed some light on what other states are doing successfully and <coughs> maybe less successfully. Um, and so we're glad he'll, he was able to travel from DC to join us here today. Uh, then we have uh, Kim Hill, who is uh, at the end of the table there, a director of the Automotive Communities Program and associate director of the Economics and Business Group at the Center for Automotive Research. Uh, Mr. Hill is a, actually a, an earlier graduate, one of the first graduating classes of the Ford School of Public Policy. Um, his, he has held many positions uh, before coming to the Center for Automotive Research. Uh, at the center, he's actually the lead investigator on their economic impact analyses. Uh, and so his work within the Economics and Business Group is working on modeling and economic forecasting related to the auto industry and Michigan's economy. So I think, yeah, despite our efforts at transition, um, the auto industry plays a huge role in Michigan's economy. And so uh, Mr. Hill will hopefully be able to uh, provide some insight on where, where that industry is and where it will be going. Um, and then finally, we have the uh, university librarian and dean of libraries, the Harold uh, T. Shapiro Collegiate Professor of Public Policy, uh, Paul Courant, who has graciously agreed to moderate uh, uh, the discussion. He will be uh, holding the whip to keep all of our panelists in check, um, limiting their talks to 10 to 12 minutes, and then taking questions from the audience uh, and moderating the discussion. Um, so uh, with that in mind, I think we are all set to begin. The last piece of business I'd like to take care of is to thank some of the people that have worked incredibly hard to put this uh, presentation together. Bonnie Roberts and Tom Avaco from Close Up. Um, Bill Kelly uh, from the facilities department here at the Ford School, and then Joe Crane and Laura Lee um, at uh, the outreach office have worked uh, incredibly hard to put together all the, the preparations for this event, um, and I'd like to thank them very much here. With that, I'll turn it over to you. And I believe we said that uh, Mr. Hill would start. Thanks very much. There, I proved it that I graduated from STP. 
Actually, it was X when I was accepted, turned into the school of public policy over the summer, and became Ford School sometime after I left. But uh, it, it won't hold you on that, Brian. So I get to, uh, in my 10 minutes, is uh, tell you all about the auto industry in Michigan. So are you ready? Those of you from Michigan can just ignore the next few things. Um, just a little bit of background, and I don't have slides on this because you can imagine what they look like. They start really high up there and then they head down towards the bottom, uh, the bottom right hand corner. Um, 11 million vehicles are produced in the United States every year for the past decade. 11 million vehicles, 8.7 million were built in 2008. Uh, 16 million uh, light vehicle sales in 2007. By the end of 2008, that number had dropped to 13 million, and some projections are as uh, at the end of this year would be down to about 10 or 11 million. The average for the last decade has been about 16, 17 million sales. So we're dropping off probably 6 million units. Uh, I think some people would say if we're lucky this year from the end of last year. Uh, GM, Ford, Chrysler are all downsizing. You know, I'm sure you're well aware of that. Others in the country. Honda, Toyota, and Nissan are all losing sales and they're idling or reducing shifts at many of their assembly plants. And, I, and Nissan is just the latest one today announcing uh, what's going on. Um, the auto industry is in bad shape. The economy is in bad shape. Michigan has been hit hard, and many other states are also suffering. I, in my, in my time of living here in Michigan since the mid 60s, I've witnessed five recessions. And uh, since, since that time, or, or each time, the feeling is, among the state and a lot of the people, is let's diversify. <laughs> let's change our economy. Then, when the economy recovers, lo and behold, Michigan has one of the highest per capita incomes in the nation. And we're fine till the next recession hits. We kind of ride along on the fortunes of the auto industry. Now, my fear when I'm asked to speak about this or get on a panel or talk to folks about uh, diversifying the, the, the uh, economy, um, transitioning the economy, is uh, this is code for let's dump this industry and get into something else, anything else, something more high tech and something more, to coin a phrase, knowledge based. And those of us who are close to the industry and study it and work in it, uh, would know that that last bit applies to the auto industry. The premise for this panel is that there's been little discussion and no consensus regarding how Michigan should respond to this economic uh, situation, if you will, that we're in, <clears throat> yet also stay on the path of transition toward a knowledge economy. Uh, I also have a problem with the word transition. Transition implies that we're moving to something completely different, that we don't have what it is we're transitioning uh, out of into something. I prefer the word transformation. Uh, and I'll get into that in a little bit. Transformation is implying we're using what we have. The auto industry in the past has provided good, solid, middle class quality of life, all without the need of a college education. The industry, however, is changing. Even a new assembly line worker, and that's pretty much an acronym right now, a new assembly line worker, uh, is required to have two to four years of college. There's an engine plant just south of here in Dundee uh, that opened building engines and everybody, everybody there had uh, a four-year degree working at that assembly line. The prospects of the jobs, the good paying jobs, and the opportunity to uh, progress through the industry up to uh, the sky's the limit uh, are, are, you know, it was a really good situation for a lot of folks. The reason that they want college degrees these days are they've learned their lessons from the Toyotas and Hondas of the world who empower their employees to help out to improve the product, to improve the process, to work as teams, to feed it back to management and say this is what we need to be doing better, this is how we continuously improve our product. So they want people with heads on their shoulders and not just muscles and sweat. Therein lies the conundrum. We want to transition to a knowledge-based economy when we already have one. The collective vision of this industry is dirty, grimy, blood, and sweat. 
who of you from Michigan, who, not from Michigan, uh, has that, that, that image in your head? Because that, that is what we hear a lot of. The motto in Michigan, if you're not from here, is if you seek a pleasant peninsula, look about you. To paraphrase, I'd also like to suggest if you seek a knowledge-based economy, do the same. Where are we? Where is this? All right, now I get to see if I can work this or not. This slide shows Michigan's share of the U.S. automotive uh, research and development spending that goes on every year. Since 1999 up through the present, uh, the automobile industry has spent annually 15 to 18 billion dollars on researching and developing new products, new processes, things that have made your uh, the automobile you drive a, a marvel of modern science. Michigan's share of that throughout these years has hovered between the mid-60s to the mid-70 percent of that spending. We've gone from a little over uh, about 10 billion dollars up to about 13 and a half billion dollars in research and development money gets spent in Michigan every single year based just on the auto industry. Where does it get spent? It gets spent in some of the over 275 research and development automotive related facilities in the state. And it generates over 50,000 uh, 50, jobs at these, uh, at these facilities. Very high paying, very high tech, very knowledge based jobs. Many of the best workers are also working here and they make very good salaries. Uh, electrical engineers were in the top 10. Industrial engineers, the top of the states. Mechanical engineers, top in the states. The heart and soul and the intellectual base of the North American automobile industry is right here in Michigan, and I might even add the world. The industry started here and has exported its knowledge ever since. My concern is that we'll squander the resources we have instead of capitalizing on them, capitalizing these resources that are captured in this, in this region. The U.S. auto industry will survive. It's not like the lumber industry, the steel industry, the textile industry, or many other industries that came before it, uh, which left because these products could, uh, could be made more cheaply somewhere else and then shipped back here. Automobiles are very, are a high value add product with opportunities uh, to make profits for the companies that make them. Capture all their costs and make profits. Every automobile manufacturer in the world of a legitimate size, this is about you know million units, a little bit less than that, worldwide, wants to be here in North America because of the opportunities, because of the high price you're able to get for your car. We don't buy nor build $2,000 cars here. Let's see, where was it? The industry will survive and it will go back to the 10 or 11 million vehicles annually and spending billions of dollars developing them. The only questions really are who will make them and where. And that's going to probably be determined during this recession that we're in right now. Turning to the policy front, because I'm sure you want me to, uh, the Congress and administration are pushing for and will continue to push for fuel efficient vehicles through CAFE, CO2 emission reductions, cap and trade systems, and then there's also that state out west, California, that who knows what they have up their sleeve, but the industry will be responding to that. Hopefully the, uh, the politicians and the folks in D.C. will do something to bring in the consumer to the demand side of the equation, uh, such as a floor on the price of fuel, but you can catch me on the side and talk about that later. Uh, the, the folks in, in Washington are at least putting some money behind where their mouths are. With the $25 billion loan package to encourage efficiency upgrades and credits to apply to the purchase of plug-ins and also Rumors of billions focused on advanced battery research, which is really sorely needed money uh, brought into this industry at this time. 
In Michigan, we have the critical mass of highly skilled, motivated labor, the necessary educational infrastructure, and most importantly, the innovation culture that knows what to do with this and to respond to challenges. We can't let this fade away. We must leverage any transformation on the foundation of the auto industry and its assets here in the state. And at that point, I'm looking forward to hearing from my fellow panelists and uh, your questions later. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, uh, I'm John Austin. I'm currently the executive director of the New Economy Initiative for Southeast Michigan, which is uh, 10 of our states and nations leading philanthropies pooling $100 million and their influence to support the economic transformation that we need to be about. Uh, we're governed by a 20-member governing body of community leaders and foundation presidents, including Rick Snyder, who's here as one of the 20, our Ann Arbor zone. I also want to acknowledge um, Phil Power of the Center for Michigan and John Bebo, who are here and who are also providing very helpful catalytic pushes to understand our economy and what we do about it in Michigan. What's the website? Centerformichigan.org. So the Centerformichigan.org. To participate in this ongoing work, I would encourage you to be part of the team that Phil's pulling together. And much of what I'll show you today in terms of the context of Michigan in this transformation or this transition from the industrial economy that we invented, really, to uh, finding our place in the global knowledge economy uh, and what we need to do within that comes from work that we've been involved with uh, that started here really at Michigan around the future of the whole industrial Midwest and Great Lakes states uh, that I was involved with with Brookings Institution. And uh, Brittany F. Holter kane is here, I know, who's a senior researcher with Brookings who uh, produced these beautiful data graphics that I benefit from in terms of my ability to talk from them in these kinds of settings. Uh, we have unique challenges in Michigan and in the industrial Midwest that are really centered here that are largely legacies of the factory economy that we created and that provided great wealth, as Kim indicated, not least of which is just the physical legacy of uh, the predominant share of the Midwest of Michigan of uh, industrial areas and plants and brownfields. Over 60% of the nation's brownfields are in the Midwest, so the, the physical relics uh, are in the way. There's probably a river or a lake behind this complex, whatever it is. And that physical residue of the things that made us great is, is, is a defining feature. We have the low education attainment levels that Kim alluded to, the lighter states are the least well-educated. Uh, we did not need a college or post-secondary degree to earn a decent living in our factories, and our mines, and our mills. Uh, Indiana, Ohio, Michigan, uh, in particular, suffer this from this legacy. Uh, since we're so reliant on manufacturing in the factory economy and it is restructuring and under incredible competitive pressures globally, we're seeing massive numbers of dislocations and unemployment which are centered on us. This is a bit dated, but the numbers are the same or worse today. Another defining feature is that our young people who we do educate uh, at scale in the region leave us for more exciting, dynamic urban environments. Uh, again, the, the data is a bit dated, but the trend is the same. The brain drain of young, educated people from our Midwest states, with the exception of Chicago and Minneapolis, St. Paul, which are talent magnets, is a defining uh, deficit for us. Young, educated people, along with immigrants, are among the most entrepreneurial and the most willing to take risks and start new things. Uh, our pattern of reliance of a culture that got used to relying on the big paternal firms and autos and other sectors uh, the structure of our industry where lots of innovation intellectual properties locked up in those firms, uh, our lack of venture capital in the region to commercialize new technology, and this talent loss all mean that on balance our metro communities in the Midwest, including Southeast Michigan uh, and Michigan, are among the least entrepreneurial uh, in the country. We need to reanimate the kind of entrepreneurial creation that that made us what great, that uh, created the, all the great industries that matter in the Midwest, but we've lost a bit of that. However, we do have real assets in Michigan uh, that matter in today's global knowledge economy. Uh, starting with, we're still just a huge economic engine and marketplace. These are the GDP uh, output, the dark blue states and provinces, and this Midwest binational region is, is a center of tremendous economic activity. It, we're its own country, the provinces of Canada and the Great Lakes states, we'd be the second biggest economy in the world, second only to um, the U.S. as a whole. 
Tremendous innovation, the innovation infrastructure, private firms, new technology development, new processes, uh, 80, 90 percent is generated in the private sector, 10 to 15 percent in research universities where they work together and where they have the synergies like in this community we're in. That's where you see the incredible uh, new ideas, new technologies, new innovation. Uh, Michigan uh, punches above its weight in terms of new intellectual property among states and that's a consistent pattern in the whole Midwest. A third of our nation's new ideas, new patents come from this oval, this Great Lakes region. We have the, the world's leading learning infrastructure that was purposely created. The institution we're in, the other public universities, land-grant universities, colleges, community colleges, is unrivaled on earth in terms of, and it, it was a wonderful innovation that, to provide low-cost, high-quality education for every man and woman, not just the elites, and to do the research and learning with the land-grant uh, notion that would fuel commerce industry and uh, a new creation. So this network of the CIC, the Big Ten Plus, and other universities where research universities are at the hub of all the industry sectors that are emerging, materials, life and biosciences, IT, uh, they are percolating energy in and around the research university axis. When the Chinese uh, who are seeking to replicate these great institutions benchmark themselves and look at the top universities in the world. 20 of the top 100 universities in the world are in the Midwest region, including Michigan, Michigan State, uh, and that's more than any place on earth. Uh, the West Coast has 13 in the top 100. The Mid-Atlantic States and New England together have 15. And there's no place that has this innovation infrastructure. Uh, that makes us a huge center of talent generation. The dark blue states are the states and provinces that produce the talent, the engineers, the scientists, the management talent, the, the researchers. Uh, as Kim noted, almost 5% uh, of all U.S. engineers are produced in Michigan. Uh, and so we, we produce the talent that our countries need to compete. We also benefited immensely by inflows of talent to go to school here, to do their, people, their work here, to research here. Immigrants have been a net boon for Michigan. This shows the education levels of immigrants. Uh, our immigrants are much better educated than the folks who grew up here. 37 percent and higher have a bachelor's degree. So we need to appreciate the power, which is really the power that made Michigan what it is today. When Henry Ford opened the Rouge Complex and 100,000 people showed up for work, they showed up from all over the world. And we as a community benefit by the net inflow of talent that immigrants in refreshing our economy, in bringing new entrepreneurial creation, uh, in a state which desperately needs all the new uh, firm creation and high-tech startups, a third of our high-tech startups over the last 10 years were created by immigrants, non-native born, uh, much higher than most states in the national average. So it's a huge source of strength for us. Another huge resource for us is this special place we live in, uh, this Great Lakes state, this wonderful peninsula with its waterfronts and its rivers and its forests and its woodland, many obscured by the industrial legacies and pollution that our wealth generating economy created, but it is a beautiful place and when place matters, when today's workers and people want to live with access to water and a special quality of life, we have this resource. We do have emerging comparative advantage in key sectors. We're in the top 10 in the nation, in Detroit and around in the creative economy, artists, design, music, the 313 is us. And it's, it's a wonderful source of a new competitive strength, new industries, new uh, economic activity. We are the cockpit for advanced manufacturing. We have the ability to leverage the incredible research and development engines in next generation energy uh, from the new battery technologies which are going to be built and created by folks here at this university in partnership with the private sector to the new freshwater technology firms and, and learnings that the world needs. It's a growing uh, global enterprise to conserve, protect, and nurture our water. Uh, it's the next oil in the words of the president of Dow. We have world leading health, medical, bio, pharmaceutical, research, learning, teaching, and innovation 
attributes, including this institution uh, where we are to leverage. We're at the center of the global market and uh, the North American largest marketplace on earth, our, our relation with Canada. And we tend to forget that even innovations like the internet were nurtured here. University of Michigan with other Big Ten partners created the spine and the internet. And so developing those technologies for the future is part of our opportunity. These are just a few examples of hope ripped from the headlines yesterday. Uh, there have been released in Washington a paper about pushing a network of university hubbed research institutions for repurposing our federal energy strategy, which Tom Walsh wrote about on Sunday, which would fuel the complex of research and learning around next generation energy here. Uh, Peter Luke wrote a report uh, that was applauding the opportunity we have to clean up the Great Lakes with the stimulus money and rebuild the water and infrastructure and sewer systems that can help us leverage the special quality of place. Paul Caron and other economists did the study that said a $20 billion investment is a huge multi-billion dollar economic engine for our states. And um, NPR just ran a, a, a radio show uh, with um, um, uh, that um, Martina Guzman put together that shows, look, in, in spite of outflows of people from Detroit, immigrants are still coming and they're revitalizing Mexican town. And they're a source of new urban development and strength, which we need to embrace and further. So there is hope. Thank you. National Governors Association, um, and, uh, and I want to talk a little bit about uh, what Kim said. He mentioned uh, he was talking about transformation, and so I'd like to drill down a little bit farther on the transformation of workers. We've talked about post-secondary education. We've talked uh, a lot about research universities and, and briefly about community colleges. But first, I'll tell you a little bit about our organization. The National Governors Association was started in 1908 by Theodore Roosevelt, right after he'd become president of the United States. He'd, of course, been governor of New York, and really saw um, a lack of communication, so to speak, between the states and, and the federal government. And so the real purpose of the NGA, and it, it remains the, uh, so today, is to represent the interest of the governors collectively. So we get into a lot of states' rights issues, and, uh, and every day it's, it's, it's been a real uh, lesson in federalism. I work for a separate but affiliated organization called the NGA Center for Best Practices. And whereas, whereas our parents are fo my, our parent organization is focused on federal policy, the NGA Center is focused on helping states make better policy. And so we we travel a lot. I have a lot of colleagues that focus on many different uh, policy specialties, roads, bridges, prisons, K through 12 education. As you can imagine, K through 12 is our largest because it reflects the interests and funding of governors and states. So it's, it's the largest. My area is post-secondary education. Now, if you're not familiar with state government, post-secondary education, and, I'm, and of course I'm generalizing among states, has fallen relatively low on the, on the list of policy priorities for governors. There's a number of reasons for that. Funding, um, most post public post-secondary education systems were created to be separate from the mores of the political system. So they had their you know, appointed regents and such. Um, but the interest, so in, in the past, it's the, the interest has been relatively low, but that's really changed, and it's changed quite a bit in the past five years. In fact, we've tracked this data for about 50 years, and nowhere before, except for a, a brief blip in the 60s along the foundation of community colleges, has there been a greater level of interest. Now, the interests are a bit different, and so we still hear about access and affordability and these type of things, but the real interests are what I'll call more pragmatic. How do we get more math and science teachers into the classroom? What's this thing called economic development? And what's the role of the universities? And for better or for worse, the, the real language of this thing called economic development has primarily been focused on, well, the University of Michigan's of the world. It's on tech transfer, on things that are sexy. How do we produce the next Google? How do we really transform our economy to a biotech one? And, and that's fine, and that's important, but, but it also, as Kim mentioned, it really often neglects the assets that you already have. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. So right now, uh, I've, I've been at NGA about three years. We have a project under, that we've undertaken that's really trying to understand these linkages between post-secondary education, not just research universities, and industry. 
And so industry defined very broadly, so not just the multinationals. It's startups, it's small manufacturers, it's dry cleaners. But post-secondary education defined broadly, community colleges, comprehensives, and research universities. So we, we've learned a few things, and it's been pretty interesting. One, um, despite what you hear, there, most of the decline in funding has been led by a, just a few states. So funding has been stable, but there's been an outlier effect by a few states that have drastically cut higher education. Now with that said, most funding has been flat. It hasn't been growing very much. Also from a governor's perspective, there hasn't, because of what I talked about earlier, about uh, the fact that there hasn't been um, a lot of interest, relatively speaking, there's very little capacity at a legislative level or at a governor's office level to understand these very complex issues. What is tenure? You know, how is this, how is funding done? How do you do a budget each year? Because in, a, in, a lot, in most states, it's done by a formula or it's done incrementally. So that's a, that's a challenge. And then, more importantly, when, you, when it comes to economic development, there's very few ways to coordinate among the institutions. I mean, other than meeting on the football field every Saturday, how often do, you, you know, researchers collaborate? Now, they, they do, but how often do we actually talk about the benefits of that collaboration to a state? And there's a tension there, and it's one that it's very difficult to understand. But I think one of the major real challenges, and, I, and I'm, unfortunately I'm not familiar with the Cherry Commission, I, I uh, didn't have a chance to read up on that, is, is a real strategic look at post-secondary education and basically how all the parts fit together. Now, the reason this is, many, many of us know the reasons why this is important. Uh, the current economic crisis, changing demographics. I've, I've, uh, I've learned this recently that th there's, relatively speaking, there's lower attainment rates with my generation and the succeeding generations than my parents' generation. So fewer and fewer people are getting college education. And so that's, that's an issue. And part of that is differing demographics and populations. So the way we provide higher education right now doesn't necessarily fit the, the way populations are changing. And so it's another another important element. But I think one of the main issues is really attainment. So this, this applied attainment issue, um, it's not just getting a college degree for sake of a college degree. It's, it's becoming well-skilled in a way that will benefit society, including enabling people to get a job. And this brings up a very sticky uh, statement that I often make called, that's not real popular in universities, it's called productivity and learning. So as a state, how do you give people the best and most immediately useful education in the quickest period of time for the least amount of money possible serving a very different population. Now that's a really, that's a lot in just a few different sentences. But if we don't start thinking that way, what'll happen is sort of what I'll call the golden rule of state legislatures. That which we don't understand, we cut. And so instead of really looking at strategic at these things strategically, it's a, it becomes a zero-sum game. Let's just cut the state budget because look, University of Michigan is not giving us enough nurses. But obviously, it's much more complicated than that. So where do we start? If we're really thinking about these different populations, if we're really thinking about the provision of higher education, do we start with the University of Michigan? I argue not. I think, I think we start, we have to start with these very diverse populations with community colleges. Now, in many regions, community colleges are pulling double duty. They're serving as one-stop job placement centers, training incumbent workers, granting associate degrees for people that will go on to four-year institutions. Now, there's been a lot of efforts among the states to really look at community college systems. So that, back to that coordination issue I was talking about earlier, there are many states that have done this. So Kentucky, for example, created a, a community college system, a strong system, about five years ago really as the center of a statewide strategy to combine both education and workforce development. So it's not seeing these as something, well, you go to school and then you go and work. Well, actually, you need both. You need education, but it should be applied to help you go get work. So it's a strong system. It's a cabinet level position, which means that governor sees that person almost every day. It's a cabinet secretary for education and workforce development. And to make it relevant, they, they employ uh, a strategy called career pathways. So pretty much if you take X, Y, and Z courses, you know within a fairly narrow spectrum what you're gonna be doing in a few years. 
There's other places like Washington that not only think of this in terms of education provisions, but also think about older workers in the sense that their needs to actually go to education will, will be very different. The average community college student is 28 years old. So they probably have a family, they probably have been employed. So the state of Washington is providing things like fi part-time financial aid options. You all that have financial aid, you're going full-time. Most people that have part-time don't have that luxury. Benefits, childcare, and so on. But this is not enough. And this is where most states do really, really do not have the infrastructure, infrastructure excuse me, to support substantial increases in applied attainment. But states are trying, and they started trying recently. And so your southern neighbor, Ohio, has actually been looking at this quite a bit. Now what they're doing in Ohio is quite controversial. In fact, what they did was make the chancellor out of actually part of the governor's cabinet. So make, basically making the regents an honorary position. That's a huge change in, in American higher education. So basically, higher education has become an agency of the state government. Now, I'm not here to argue that's a good or bad thing, but what's driving it is, the, like Michigan, the economic situation in Ohio, heavily related to the automotive industry. What's different about this, and I think I have about one minute left, is that, is that the, at least their strategy, and we'll see how it goes, it sets clear expectations, 30 seconds, for attainment by institution and then measures them. It also focuses on older populations by combining community college with worker training centers. So using federal money, state money, and other sources to do this. It harmonizes basic curriculum but allows differentiation among different institutions based off the needs of the region and the needs of the, the economy in those regions. And, and by the way, it actually stabilizes funding in this very, very bad year the governor just proposed a 6% increase. So I think this is a good example, uh, at least something to look at for Michigan and something where Michigan has a very important opportunity. And yes, the K through 12 numbers are quite good in Michigan. You've got great institutions, you've got great kids. And I think this would be something that really would make an impact, not just in the short term, but in the long term as well. Thank you. My name is Charles Ballard. I'm a uh, professor in the Department of Economics at Michigan State University. Yeah, yes, that's right, Michigan State, not the University of Michigan. But before you Wolverine fans uh, boo me off the stage, I want to tell you that my grandfather and my mother went to U of M, and right now my son is a junior who claims to be majoring in psychology right here at U of M, and so my son and much of my money come right in into the uh, Washtenaw County economy. Um, and I root for the Wolverines almost all games. There's, there's only one opponent against which I don't root for the Wolverines. Um, uh, I'm gonna make, let me go back. So here's my, here's my title. Let's have a graduated income tax and eliminate the Michigan business tax. Uh, I, I, want, I can echo many of the things that have been said by the three previous speakers. Um, I like the word transformation. It's clear that since we are now in the ninth consecutive year of job losses in the state of Michigan. We peaked in June of 2000. We've lost jobs steadily since. The cumulative losses are more than 630,000, uh, which is about 14% of the employment that we had back in the year 2000. So that's not a business cycle. That's a fundamental structural transformation. Um, along with that, we now, in 2007, which is the most recent year for which we have the data, Michigan's per capita income fell 9% below the national average. That's the lowest it's ever been, lower even than in 1933. So there's plenty of causes for concern. On the other hand, the good news is, uh, well, the speakers have given lots of reason for good news, lots of reason to believe that we can make the transformation in a very beneficial way. But so many of the things that we're, have, are being talked about in terms of changing our attitudes toward education and, and becoming a more highly skilled state, those are things that will happen over a long period of time. So I want to talk about something that we could enact uh, this year, and uh, more, which I believe will have very beneficial effects. Two pieces, graduated income tax, eliminate the Michigan business tax. Now, some on the left may say, oh, graduated income tax, that's great, but I, I want to keep the business tax. 
Some on the right might say the opposite. I'm going to try to make the case that it's a win-win. Um, it, moreover, like it or not, policy discussions about these and other tax policy changes are going on right now. So first I'll start with the graduated income tax. What are the reasons? Well, over the past um, generation, we've had a phenomenal increase in income inequality. Uh, and that means that the ability to pay taxes is more concentrated than it used to, used to be. Uh, frankly, if I were to go back to what I was thinking about tax policy in Michigan 15 years ago, yeah, I was sort of for a graduated income tax, but not as much as I am now, because year after year, the uh, distribution of, e of income has become more unequal. Second point, federal deductibility. When I pay a dollar in income tax to the state of Michigan, it costs me 72 cents. That reveals that I'm in the 28% bracket uh, for my federal re return. Uh, also, uh, many parts, not just the income tax, the sales tax is even worse. Many parts of Michigan's revenue service are not very responsive to changes in the, the economy. As the economy grows, revenues grow less rapidly. Therefore, we have periodic uh, crises in our uh, public budgeting. And finally, it's something for which I think there's substantial public support, and I'll talk about all of these in turn. Now, this is a, a data graph that I, I don't have time to go into all of the details, but uh, this is from work that I and my colleague at Michigan State, Paul Menchik, uh, did. And we compare at different places in the income distribution, like the fifth percentile, that's right there, the median, which is the 50th percentile. So the fifth percentile, that's below the poverty level. Median, um, kind of a middle class. 95th percentile, $160,000, $170,000 family income. We compare in recent years with the same place in the income distribution uh, about a 30 years before. And what you can see is that in Michigan, uh, the bottom half of the income distribution has gone exactly nowhere for a generation. But as soon as you get above the median, greater and greater growth. This is one of many ways that we could say that um, the distribution of income has become more unequal. This is a nationwide trend, not just in Michigan, but Michigan e echoes the nationwide trend in many ways. Uh, this is another way of saying the same thing, which instead of having percentiles on the horizontal axis, I've got dollar amounts in, uh, in 2005 dollars. Um, 36 states and the District of Columbia and the federal government and the governments of all of the OECD countries except, uh, have, have a, uh, a graduated income tax. Michigan is one of only seven states with a flat rate income tax. If you're going to raise a, a given amount of revenue with a flat rate, that means that you're going to raise more from the people at the bottom and relatively less than the, from the people at the top. Um, and this. Um, I don't know if you can read this, but it, it tells you that we are, we have one of the lowest top rates. We're 41st among the states in terms of the top rate. And we're 10th among the states in terms of the size of the rate that applies to the first dollar of taxable income. Lots of details in these graphs which we could talk about if we, if we have time, but just to give you some sense of where we stand. Um, uh, note also, uh, with if your dollar of uh, income is fully deductible and the alternative minimum tax at the federal rate, at the federal level, does create complications for a lot of upper income folks. But if you're fully uh, deductible, um, which at least in the last tax year I was, and I hope that's still true this year and that I don't have to pay AMT, uh, the, the net effect of the Michigan tax system becomes actually regressive. The, the effective rate, including the flat rate at the state level and the federal deductibility, becomes, uh, you get a situation where the rates are actually going down with income, the effective addition to the federal rate caused by Michigan. I, among my many hats, I am the director of something called the State of the State Survey, which is a quarterly uh, public, uh, public survey of Michigan adults. Uh, and one that we did about a year ago asked a question about the graduated tax. Of course, for public opinion polls, you can't use words like graduated because four-syllable words are too big for polls. But we think we asked the question the right way. And we found that of those who gave an intelligible answer, four out of seven were in favor, substantial support. 
And the breakdown is interesting. I'd per point particularly to the breakdown of the support among income groups. Not surprisingly, folks less than 30,000 of income, very solidly in favor, but even at the above 70,000 group, it's a tie, uh, which I found uh, favorable. I won't tell you exactly how much I make, uh, but like a lot of PhDs, we've done very well in the economy in the last generation. I'm, in, I'm definitely in the above 70,000 group. I would pay more under a graduated tax, uh, so it's not in some sense in my narrowly defined economic self-interest, but I think it's a better policy. All right, then, how can we make this work in terms of Uh, 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 getting it through the public, because there have been attempts before to have a graduated income tax, and they have run into very staunch opposition from conservative and business groups. Well, uh, m the trade that I think would be a, an excellent grand compromise would be to get rid of the Michigan business tax. I don't know how close you followed. We had a pretty good business tax called the single business tax. When it was first enacted in 1975, it kind of got worse and worse over time. Then we got rid of it and replaced it with something a whole lot worse, which is the Michigan business tax. So I ask, why do we tax businesses at all? After all, in Econ 201, I tell my students, business taxes aren't paid by people. Ugh, say that wrong. Business taxes aren't paid by businesses. They have to be paid by people, either in higher prices for consumer goods, either in lower wages for workers, or in lower returns for investors. Um, the public may have at one time thought that the business tax was a progressive tax. I doubt it very much. And in fact, the public, now if, if you were to ask me what's the long run incidence of the tax, I would say that it's probably passed on to workers. Um, because of mobile capital, but the public seems to think that it's, a, that it's like a sales tax, that it's passed on to consumers. So uh, if it was ever justified, uh, I'm not sure of the justification now. Um, so if we were to eliminate the, the MBT and introduce a graduated income tax, here's what we would do. We would make our overall tax system more progressive, which in view of the increased inequality is, I think, a very good idea. We would eliminate a tax that causes some of our biggest headaches in terms of just filling out the forms. Um, we would export more of our tax burden to other states through federal deductibility. How much of a rate would it take? Um, well, uh, these give you some sense of it. And um, if you were to replace all of the MBT revenues, you'd, and, and if you were to have any meaningful graduation, you'd have to have a, a rate a top rate in Michigan in excess of 7%, probably closer to 8%. That's getting kind of high uh, in terms of incentive effects that we economists do worry about. And so uh, my favorite would be to go into the sixes um, because if we, we could replace the current income tax revenues and the old SBT revenues with a graduated income tax with rates very similar to those in Kansas. And I like to say Kansas because it's not known as a hotbed of left-wing radicalism. <laughs> uh, and then we could replace the rest of the MBT with revenues from other sources. I got a couple of other slides, but I'll stop now. Thank you very much. So, um Now we get to talk to each other. Um, Is this thing on? Okay, good. And I guess I'd like to start by letting um, our, panelists, our panelists talk to each other. Uh, each of you will get one question to ask any other one of you. Um, and um, then a brief answer, and then we'll turn things over to the crowd. So John, you're the closest. Ask somebody a question. So, as a trained was, economist. So you, you want me to talk about everything? Um, <laughs> oh, well, uh, since the, the publication of my book, which is titled Michigan's Economic Future, which, by the way, I don't think is an oxymoron, um, it was published about two and a half years ago, and, and that 
generated a lot. Of, people would read it and they said, hey, come and address my group. So I've given about 75 talks around the state. I've been in Kalkaska, Cadillac, Coldwater, Cassopolis, and other places. Um, anyway, um, I, uh, I, I really stress education um, and, and skill. And um, so I talk about a lot of the issues that you emphasize. And, but I hasten to add, you know, I show how college attainment is so, so important, and it's much more important than it used to be a generation ago because the rate of return to a college education has soared while the high school educated and the high school dropouts have gone nowhere or fallen off a cliff. So I really emphasize training and skill, but it would be easy for people to say, well, yeah, and, and you work for a four-year degree-granting institution, so it's all you're just, you just want a, a slop at the trough. Well, it's hard for me to refute because, of course, my own self-interest is for healthy universities. But on the other hand, the data about the importance of college education are overwhelming. But it's also true that I think we're underinvested in education in Michigan from preschool to PhD. Um, in fact, one of the investments that a society can make that may have as high a rate of return, social rate of return, as any is getting them ready for for kindergarten. If you're if you're behind, I mean, you know, if you think of your life as a marathon and you're not ready for kindergarten, it's sort of like the other runners are at the three mile mark and you haven't even started. So that's incredibly important. Then the high school dropout is is a catastrophe. Um, proposal A uh, equalized somewhat the funding for public school operating expenses but not for public school capital expenses. And so our poorer school districts have a physical plan, buildings that are not up to code, that are not, in, in, in my view, having been in some of these buildings, it's, it's offensive in, this, in a country this rich that any child would have to go to school in, in the buildings of the quality of some of the buildings in, in the state of Michigan. Of course, the more affluent districts have fabulous facilities. So um, along all of those dimensions, and then there's also a huge role for the community colleges, for the places like Baker College, and so on. Uh, so it's not just four-year universities. It's really a culture of lifelong learning. And until we can get that culture deeply ingrained. Oh, one more. Uh, we've got a school, school year that was developed in the 19th century. Uh, and, uh, and it made sense when what you wanted was for your kids to pick the bugs off the potato plants all summer long and, and, and hoe the cornrows. But I don't know a whole lot of kids who do that anymore. So the agricultural basis for our 180-day school year is, is long gone. It's time to move into at least, I, I'd sell for the 20th century, you know. Um, so I, I have to say that I've always wanted to have kids who would be willing to pick bugs off potatoes in the summer, but it's never worked out for any of the kids I have. I'll say something slightly more substantive uh, in the context of this discussion. Um, whatever else you think, each of the discussions we've had has indicated not a diminished role for the public sector. Having a tax structure that nobody can stand uh, and having a tax structure uh, that is really unfriendly um, to both labor and capital, and we've managed to do that, um, uh, is simply not helpful. Uh, whether you think the money ought to go to longer K through 12 years or for preschool or, or even, for state, uh, even for state universities. Um, so, um, Kim, why don't you ask somebody a question? Not Charlie. <laughs> Not Charlie. Okay. Uh, Chris, I just wondered if you could discuss what lessons uh, the state of Michigan might take from the Governor's Association in, in working together with other states that are in similar situations that are very reliant on, on the industry I spoke about. Uh, one of my biggest goals is in, in, in what I do in my work is to see something like this happen, but it's one of the most frustrating things to do. I know that through the universities, uh, this one I, I know firsthand is working uh, across state lines and with, with other organizations to uh, you, you know, to, to foster and to really to help transform this economy, but at the state level, at the economic development level, uh, their hands are tied for a variety of reasons. 
Yeah, and, uh, and by the way, I think some would say that the universities were uh, designed based off of a 13th century model, so... Uh... Oh, even earlier than that. <laughs> <laughs> Should have worn my robes. <laughs> no, it's, 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 a great, it's a great question, and, and unfortunately, um, in the way that American, you know, the way the American governance uh, federalist system has evolved, it's, it definitely does not uh, incentivize cross-border collaboration, especially among states. It's uh, even more difficult. I mean, look at our uh, suburbanization and exurbanization, exurbanization, you know what I mean, uh, problem that's happening in, in, the, in the core cities. Um, so there are very, very few cross-state collaborations, especially with regard um, to workforce training and other things, but they do happen. And, and I think it's actually common industries that allow them to happen or a sector strategies approach that, that actually work. And so I'm, I'm familiar with a couple. I know, uh, in, in, in particular, it's these urban, you know, these multi-state, multi-county urban areas uh, that have really uh, gotten into the down and dirty details. So Kansas City, Missouri, and Kansas City, Kansas. I mean, it just by, you know, you, you walk across the street and you're in a different state. And so there has been some harmonization of school funding formulas. Um, also in the Portland, uh, watch, sort of southern Washington state area, especially along the lines of training uh, workers in the in manufacturing and semiconductor industry, um, the states have worked together to put in monies into a common pot based off of uh, number of workers in those regions. Those things are extremely painful and take time and are you know political hot potato, but they do happen, and it and it's largely it's been community leaders that have been responsible. So I, I don't know if that answers your question, but it, it needs to be definitely more of it. So I'm going to pick up other questions from the panel. Um, as we go along, but now I think uh, since everyone in the panel has got at least one second thing to say, I'd like to turn it over to questions from the audience. Yes, sir. Yes. I thank you for the panel. I, I wanted to start with, I think it was John's slide about the brain drain with the exception of Chicago and Minneapolis St. Paul. Mm -hmm. um, and and it, it suggests a, a kind of a failure of urban policy. And, and, I, and I guess one, we haven't talked much today about Detroit. And there's an issue of can you have a revitalization of the state economy without addressing Detroit. Um, but when I look at Detroit as someone coming from the hometown of San Francisco, it strikes me as, as, as trying to figure out what it is about the auto industry that perhaps failed on three counts. It did generate high wages, but it didn't seem to generate a kind of spin-off innovation in a wide range of sectors uh, beyond auto and related. Um, it didn't really succeed in generating a kind of rich urban culture that more diversified cities such as Chicago or even Pittsburgh have. Um, and maybe even the industry failed to really generate a kind of um, more progressive and friendly rather than poisoned racial culture in the industry and in the city suburbs. So is there something about the auto industry, particularly in Detroit, that failed on those three counts, to put it harshly? I would say yes, and let me get at it real quick. Um, one feature, and everyone's trying to figure out what is it that makes some places attractive to young talent. Uh, I think the, the, the main driver is young people flock to places that there's some generalized sense that they're going to be professional opportunities. So therefore, Chicago, it, it, it's, it's a good question to ask, what is the business of Chicago? Well, it's everything these days, and, and we still can only answer well in Southeast Michigan, it's auto. So we haven't percolated this more diverse economic set of uh, opportunities that is the first driver, but you're alluding to major second drivers include people want to be in a diverse, multi-ethnic, racially more integrated urban environment that has density and multinational populations in the urban core in part. That's an exciting place to be, e.g. San Francisco and New York and now Minneapolis and, and Chicago. So that's a driver. But also I would say, and the biggest failure of our community uh, with its auto and really paternal big employers and institutions that dominate it is we've been spending our time kind of protecting the industry that made us great from change uh, versus embracing change. So I think young people and all people these days are moved by also a set of values. They want to be part of social change. They want to be part of greening the world. They want to be part of climate change. If our reputation, which is based on fact in Michigan, is we're trying to protect the carbon economy engines that made us great from change, that produces an, an attitude and a culture that, that is 
in view of many, uh, not embracing the change and leading in green and cleaning, climate change, social justice, social equity, but trying to protect what made us great from change, which we've been fiercely doing until about last year. And so it's no surprise that young people flee us for places that are in the vanguard of creating the kind of future that they want to be a part of. But let me uh, say one thing about Minnesota, which is the uh, uh, Minneapolis-St. Paul, of course, is a driving force for any aggregate statistics for Minnesota. So Minnesota has, a, of all the states in the Great Lakes region, Minnesota has the highest um, educational attainment in terms of the percentage who have a bachelor's degree and or more. And not surprisingly, they also have higher per capita income than any other state in the Great Lakes region. But moreover, I saw showed a slide about the disequalization. The, if you were to show the same graph for Ohio and Illinois, it's almost identical except not quite as bad as in Michigan. Uh, same for Indiana, same for Pennsylvania. Minnesota is one of the few exceptions nationally. And I think what's going on there is that not only do they have a high percentage of their, um, of their uh, workforce who have a college degree, but they also have the highest in our region uh, of, uh, who have a high school uh, diploma. And I also think that there may, they may have a culture whereby a high school diploma in Minnesota actually means that you have a 12th grade education. <laughs> yeah. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say uh, this has really been addressed towards something like my life. I, as a descendant of immigrants who came around the time the Fort Rouge plant opened to work in industry, I was educated as an engineer at Michigan, and then I saw the writing on the wall and got a Ford School degree, and now I'm a knowledge, now I'm a knowledge worker, and look at me, this is great. Uh, <laughs> you have time to come to one of these Yeah, forms. exactly. <laughs> no, but, so the education clearly helps. The, the employment numbers that came out on Friday uh, show 12% you know, unemployment for people with a, who dropped out of high school, 3.8% nationwide for people with a bachelor's degree. That doesn't sound very high. Our economy is serving the educated pretty well. Um, even in Michigan, we have you know, Auto Alley is showing, there's an organization showing how high-tech industry is thriving in Southeast Michigan. University Research Corridor universities do a lot of great research. Uh, and, and a lot of the educated come from other states. They, we educate people, they go to Chicago. Uh, so there, there's a little bit of spillover there. But what do we do about the, the, the part of our economy that Mr. Hill talked about, that they, they, were, they were, were brought up in an industry where you didn't need education. They basically stepped out of the time machine from the 1950s middle class, and now they're here, and they're not going to Chicago. Uh, so uh, I wish I had the answer, so I'll ask you, what about it? <laughs> it underscores the urgency which we all have been involved with in Michigan to try to uh, raise the education attainment and achievement rates. Uh, the Cherry Commission and related agendas that we've been trying to move include some long-term, in Charles's words, building blocks of that. Everybody needs to get to and through post-secondary, period. And so that's part out of that came, we now have high school exit standards, which were new, to basically require everyone to learn relevant things before they can leave high school. We put it money to pay for post-secondary, not enough, but for more people. We, asked our community colleges and our universities to work together to ensure better completion of folks who are enrolled. We put money in to diversify the economy that percolates out of higher ed. So this is an agenda that's a long-term essential element for Michigan. I think in, in the Minneapolis um, analog is relevant. We in Michigan, along with our sister states in, in sort of the heavy industrial heartlands, we just got more of the folks coming from the South, uh, black and white. I grew up in West Virginia. I never heard as many uh, West Virginia accents as when I lived outside Flint, who, because the jobs were here. The no skill demanding factory jobs at scale. Minneapolis, St. Paul did not have nearly that number of opportunities and they didn't get the massive influx of relatively uneducated white and black folks from the South and Appalachia to come here. And those folks redefined us and our culture in Michigan and are left with this legacy that we have of lots and lots of now adults and a culture where the young people who grew up in those households never expected and hoped that they wouldn't need to have the kind of post-secondary rigorous education that is, is required. As Kim said, to work in a high-tech manufacturing facility, you need a post-secondary set of technical skills today. So we just have that challenge more than most places. It's one of the legacies of our 
factory economy scale. And so we've got to do everything and every, anything we can to help up the achievement levels for all our people and create the conditions that make our place attractive and universities are a poor in which we attract people uh, who want to come here and be part of a new round of creation versus leave us. And I, and I think, I mean, you know, college is not a monolithic entity. And I mean, the, the, the population you're talking about are not the people that their parents send them to college for four years, they have a great time and they graduate and get a job. I mean, the people that you're talking about are people who have been working for 30 years, they're 48 years old with three kids, and they don't know what they're going to do. And that's the problem, is that we, it's fairly easy to get people to go to a community college and take classes. I mean, they're fairly accessible. There, there's, there's not huge admission requirements. And most people, I mean, I, would, I don't know Michigan's numbers, but I know in a lot of places, people actually have high school education. And, and people actually have a little bit of college. But it's, it's actually, you know, it's been so long, you know, why do I need calculus? Why do I need to do these things? And, and so you might even get a pe person with an associate's. But where do they go now? They're not going to fit into a freshman English class at the University of Michigan. I mean, why should they do that? But, and, and so it really brings up this issue of, of you know, college is, is not college is not college. It, it, it's applied attainment in the sense of how can we get that person the skills they need to get the job that they need to help our economy. And so there, there's been a lot of debate along the lines of the applied baccalaureate. Right, so, so it's, it's an HVAC, you know, a heating and air conditioning technician. By the way, the average in New England, I don't know what it is um, nationwide, starting salary with one year of a degree is $72,000. Now that, that's pretty darn good. That's more than I made when I was you know, 22 years old out of, out, of, out, of, out of community college. But the idea that, you know, of really looking at our education system, not necessarily as a, as a rite of passage through certain you know, certain classes. That's the, you know, people can have that if they can afford that and they're young enough to do it. But the real challenge, and I think the challenge for Michigan and other states like it, is really everybody else. What do we do with, with those good people? Peter. Uh, I'd like to talk a minute about the graduate. Yeah, you only get to talk for more than a minute. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I have a lot of scars from efforts to get a graduated income tax. And I think the biggest problem we found in the old days was easily encapsulated as a Joe the Plumber problem. If I had, if my boss's business were for sale and if it were making $250,000, and if I could possibly afford to buy it, uh, I'd buy it and I'd be rich and your tax, your higher taxes would hurt me. And that's a very common attitude among people who would benefit from any tax reduction in a uh, uh, graduate income tax. I wish you'd talk a little bit about the politics of it, and how you might combine the two ideas to get business on its side, on, on the side of it, and also what are these Kansas rates that you talked about, and would they provide enough gain at the lower income levels to uh, try to create a real constituency for that kind of a, a tax shift? Sure. All right. Uh, the uh, let's see. Uh, first of all, in terms of the uh, politics of it, I think Joe the Plumber may, be, may, may have some, um, some reluctance. All I can say is, you know, um, public education and, and re remind Joe the Plumber that your chances of, of having, of being in the, the top group are probably small. Uh, but a lot of the opposition, I think, has come from folks who have a uh, hundred times as much income as Joe the Plumber, who know that with their current income, they would pay more. Um, and that's, that's a fact, and I don't think, I, my guess is that the, some folks at the top of the income scale would, wouldn't change their minds no matter what I say. Um, but part of it has come from opposition from business groups. Now, I don't know if we could get the Michigan Chamber to go along. Uh, I think there are, but, but I think a lot of the, the businesses, especially smaller and medium-sized businesses who have been clobbered by the MBT, uh, would, would be happy to, to uh, go for elimination of the MBT, it, even if it meant uh, a graduated income tax. Um, uh, let's see, Kansas, uh, bottom rate is three point something and top rate is 6.35. Uh, and they and they raise. I have one one thing that's nice. If you uh, 
our professor of economics at a Lansing area institution, you have uh, PhD students who now work for state government, so I have a friend who's run a lot of these things for me. Um, and um, it's, uh, you know, there's, it, I think we should be clear that there's no way that the that pushing toward graduation in a state income tax will reverse the huge tidal wave of inequality that's, that we've seen over the last generation, but it can chisel at the edges of it. Um, and uh, that the Kansas uh, tax raises, the, their income tax raises about $1,700 per person more than ours does. And that is, that would be, so that would be sufficient roughly to not only replace the uh, existing uh, income tax revenues that we have, but not the full MBT, but the, the old single business tax revenues within cl as close an approximation error as we economists can usually get. In back. Um, thanks. Uh, I, uh, I appreciated all the um, assets that the state has, and I think that you're right on that. I guess the question I have is it seems to me that um, the current economic downturn that we're in and any kind of stimulus that uh, comes our way, there's, we're going down and it's going to take several years, even with people attaining higher education, um, to you know, realize the goals that you're talking about. So it seems to me that for the next two to three to four years, Michigan is just going to continue to lose population as well as all the support services that, that make it up. We're going to get more diversified because that's because the auto industry is going to shrink, continue to shrink, at least the manufacturing part. Does anybody have anything more optimistic to look at over the next four years? Come on, Ken, <laughs> Come on. Come on, you guys. Well, I was going to take the not optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, you know, the numbers don't look that good. We're, we're constantly looking for the optimistic side of it. The, you know, like I said, the, uh, I mean, there's no avoiding the industry in the state. So one always has to address that and then say, how is that going to impact a lot of other things? The, the industry creates uh, a vast number of jobs just by being here. It, it turns out probably four or five more jobs in the, in the Michigan economy just for every one worker in the auto uh, sector. Uh, so if the Auto climate nationally is bad. If it's if it's bad globally, uh, you know the sales numbers, which generate the revenues, which generate the jobs, which generate the spinoff jobs, uh, are tough. The stimulus. One would hope that uh, the stimulus. The reason they talk about let's let's make things, let's do something with the money, so that people don't just invest it somewhere and it gets holed up, is to get people working to get money moving through that economy. Uh, it seems like with the, with the financial sector meltdown, then unfortunately the, the federal government is the only game in town to churn money through the, uh, through the economy. And, and the companies that are in the auto industry are heavily reliant on short-term loans to finance new products, to <coughs> research and develop things, to put money out in front before the revenue stream picks up. So, uh, you know, frankly, we are looking at, at something very positive out of the stimulus package that would aim itself toward the industry to keep these companies working on product development so that uh, as the economy recovers, uh, hopefully in a year, uh, that, that, that Product then starts coming through the, you know, product then starts getting built. It, it, the, the worst thing we can see in the auto industry is they severely cut back on product development, the thinking part of it. Um, so it's not so, very optimistic. But. Let me make just a comment on this. Um, so I've lived through, I'm not quite sure how many recessions in Michigan, quite a few. Um, and every time this is the question that comes up, Things look bad for the auto industry for the next couple of years. What are you going to do about that? And we sort of struggle and hope for various things that would stimulate demand so we get back up to 16 million units again. Uh, and, and every time, 
the long-run solutions are actually not that different from each other. Improve K through 12, have a tax structure that's more flexible, uh, try to create a more entrepreneurial spirit in the state, um, have, you know, strengthen the universities. I'll even leave the universities out. It's too self-serving. Um, and, and so the ability to have a, a stable enough structure so that we can actually look at the long term is going to make the next short term better. So that's very conditional optimism, but at least some notion there. Brian? Uh, question for uh, Tim Hill. Um, I was just wondering whether you have, uh, as someone who's not particularly familiar with the auto industry, any specific suggestions as to, you know, I think you could, I, we've talked about how things kind of look very bad from one perspective, there's lots of assets from another perspective, but I mean, if you could advise either the auto industry itself or policymakers, what specific suggestions do you think you could give them to make this transformation? I mean, are there changes in the practices of the industry itself that you think are yeah. necessary? Are there, other than stimulating demand, other than kind of getting people sure. to buy more cars, what well, can we do? One has to take a leap of faith that the, the economy will recover and consumers will continue to start buying things again. and. and GDP goes up and, and the like. As far as the, uh, the automakers and the, the, the states that are uh, host to in a lot of the communities, we talk to them a lot about positioning yourself for the economic recovery. The, the companies, uh, we, you know, we've heard it, that, that uh, the demand is there, hopefully it, it's not gonna tail off, but the demand for more fuel efficient vehicles is there. Something that uh, the companies in this state have dragged their feet on for many years, and I think frankly, uh, that's part of the problem, the perception problem is, uh, you know, why don't young people, uh, you know, get jobs and come into the industry is because it's an industry that said for so long, we can't do that, we can't meet those fuel efficiency requirements, we can't get that many miles per gallon, we can't do it, we can't do it, we can't do it. However, we're the most advanced industry on the planet. Uh, there's, a, there's a disconnect there. So I do firmly think that uh, consumers, and I would suggest probably most people in this room, are not fooled by $2 a gallon gas anymore. That $4 is probably more likely when a global expansion comes on and fuel is needed to drive the many engines of industry in many sectors, uh, that the demand for that oil is gonna be uh, heavy. And so, again, I said, you know, in my presentation, I said, it's not a matter of this industry surviving in this country, it will. It's a matter of who in this country that's building cars is gonna survive and where they're gonna be. And I think that, you know, without me saying names, you can envision the companies that are a little more progressive and a little further along the curve. This is a good time right now for those companies that aren't far along the curve to get on the curve and get there very quickly uh, because they have the abilities to do it. And, and I think that's, uh, that is what you have to do. You have to make this industry sexy. You have to, what John was talking about, the green economy. Uh, you know, that's gonna keep young people here. Uh, you know, if they're working for companies they think is helping uh, solve the, you know, the environmental degradation of the globe while still making these, these fabulous products, then uh, I think you've gotta do that. I think that a lot of what these folks at the table are saying are we do have to uh, enhance the foundation that we have. And, and one thing, somebody said it way earlier and I didn't get a chance to respond to it. I think one of the problems in this region here, Southeast Michigan and the Detroit area and the racial, racially divided culture, I don't know if that person's still there, is that we don't have a mass transit system. I go in a lot of places and I love hopping on the subway and hopping on uh, you know, light rail and the like, and we don't have one in Detroit, and it's, it, it, it's, uh, it's kept the, the people, you know, that are doing well away from the people that aren't doing so well and, and the places where they can get to. And I think most young people these days want to show up in a place where there's, a, where there's mass transit and the ability to get around. And, and I think those are some more investments that could be made here. Paul, can I just add to that? That's the kind of thing we should be spending the stimulus money on um, to make ourselves more yeah. attractive, but also in addition to any way to accelerate the auto folks to be leaders, not laggards in next generation transport technology, electric, hybrid. Um, the auto industry does have a tremendous um, set of competencies and there's a lot that we all can do to help 
A, the huge amount of talent that's spilling out of autos become entrepreneurs and take their intellectual property and put it to work in new industries, as well as a lot of the auto supply base can migrate to new product lines, make medical devices instead of auto parts, make energy components instead of auto parts, helping uh, them find those new product lines when they're not used to it, because they've been just happily looking in one dimension, is an offensive that the state's under. And there's a lot of real urgent possibility and opportunity there. One more. All of us, after we leave our universities or place of work or wherever, we go back home to a city, town, village, or school district. And I've, I've spent my career in public finance in Michigan, governmental finance, and I see the governmental finance model broken. The state has reneged on its promises to fund the lower units of government that touch us most closely on a day-to-day -day basis. Does anyone have any comment on public policy and what we need to do to make the places where we actually live and work more, more sustainable and vibrant. A little leadership in state government would be nice. Um, Amen. <laughs> uh, the, uh, I'm, I think that Proposal A did more uh, more good than harm, but um, I, I, I don't believe that it was uh, chiseled into stone tablets and brought down from Mount Sinai, and I think it, we may want to revisit it, uh, allow, make it easier for uh, local governments to change the property tax structure if they believe that it's good for them. Um, uh, I've heard talk about a, a local sales tax option. I, I don't know if that's a good idea, but there's talk about it. It might uh, uh, might be worth looking at. Um, and then also the uh, the cap uh, on taxable value uh, was written at a time when everybody assumed, just like the wizard on Wall Street, that, that housing prices would never go down. Well, now we've got this phenomenon that housing prices have plummeted, but then if they ever start coming up again, they'll be capped. And I've seen some really dire scenarios for. Uh, for many state and local governments and, and um, it, stretching out even to 2017, 2018, because of this, um, I think we need to revisit a bunch of those things. But I, I, I fundamentally think that the, the biggest issue is uh, what you said, that the state government has, has, has dropped the ball. The state government in its um, hurry to fix its own finances uh, has just pushed the problems down on the state and local government, onto the local governments, many of which are far more vulnerable than the state government. Not too many governors get reelected based off of their restructuring public finance platform. So, uh, which I, is, and I mean, one of the problems is, is with higher education, it's the same thing. I mean, we have fu you know funding mechanisms that were you know built in the 1930s and 40s, so we fund actually enrollment, you know, not outcomes. I mean, so okay. And I have to say, our local government structure was created centuries ago, and probably is absolutely we need more regional and intergovernmental cooperation. So, as students of public policy, we can be thrilled that there's so many <laughs> avenues for productive work to be done. Thank our panel. Thank you all very much for coming. <laughs>